When your blood sugar goes up, your fat cells will store more fat and your liver will convert your blood sugars into a fat called triglycerides. Hi friends, did you know that the number one best measure of your health that is better than blood sugar has been shown to reduce the risk of fatty liver, vision loss, sexual dysfunction, chronic back pain, kidney failure, heart attacks, strokes, bad memory, and poor skin. Now this list is basically 90% of why people see a real medical doctor. So if it's not testing for blood sugar, then can you guess what it's testing for? Well, think about what high blood sugar changes. It changes your blood flow. The better your blood flows, the healthier your body will be. Now, there are several ways to measure blood flow at home. Number one is free. You can do it to yourself right now. Take a look at the color of your toenail. Squeeze your big toenail until it turns white. And when you let go, your toenail should turn pink again within a few seconds. And if it doesn't, you should see a medical doctor. Now, if you look down and you have an opaque, thickened toenail, then you should also see a medical doctor. That could be a fungal toenail infection, which is also a sign of poor blood flow. The second thing you can do is feel the pulse at the top of your foot called the dorsalis pedis pulse. And this pulse should feel as strong as a pulse in your wrist. If you can't find it, or if it is faint, check with your medical doctor. That could also be a sign of poor blood flow. Now, the third way to measure your blood flow is an indirect measurement, and that is from your blood pressure. In fact, having a normal blood pressure, even if you have to do it with medication, has been shown to lower the risk of all those diseases that I named. Lowering blood pressure in these people could dramatically reduce their risk for heart disease. He told me he was scared to death when these results came out because he thought he would be attacked from both sides. He'd be attacked by people who said, we knew all along that blood pressure lowering would reduce risk for heart disease. How could you do a, a clinical trial that put people on placebo? Half the people in the trial were put on placebo, fake medication, not real medicine. Not necessarily true for lower blood sugars. However, the best way to lower blood pressure, improve blood flow, and reverse diseases is to get to the root cause. So let's get back to how you can do this a little later. The point is, simply having a normal blood pressure can significantly improve your blood flow. And in case you haven't noticed, the vast majority of non-cancerous disease is related to poor blood flow. Many Many of our blood labs and radiological tests indirectly measure how well your tissues are perfusing. And monitoring your blood flow to have an adequate blood perfusion throughout your body will significantly improve your quality of life much more than following the spikes of blood sugar. And this is why I'm really surprised people don't check their blood flow but pay hundreds of dollars to monitor blood sugar spikes with a continuous blood glucose monitor. Even though they don't have diabetes, there is no data on blood sugar spikes in health. Now, continuously having high blood sugars are unhealthy. That is diabetes or prediabetes. But companies and social media influencers, they're making lots of money talking about sugar spikes as if there was a correlation with hard clinical outcomes. I do think there is a concern that when you make a diet glucose-centric, in other words, you are solely focused on what that diet does to glucose, that can be harmful for anyone, including in people with type 2. Because let's say you had this is going to upset people, uh, you know, a couple of slices of bacon, some eggs, and maybe like a tomato grilled. Is that going to flatten your glucose? Yeah. Would I want to recommend that over time for cardiovascular risk, for the gut microbiome, for, you know, vascular function? I would worry about that. Don't misunderstand me. I am all for empowering people to understand their bodies with biological data. But does that data translate into better health? Not necessarily. There is zero evidence that blunting these glucose spikes in healthy non-diabetic people makes any difference to your health. And I'm in it because if people stay healthy, hospital workers won't get overwhelmed and burned out. And in case you haven't noticed, there is a huge turnover of staff at many hospitals across the country. Burnout. Hospital workers have options and the ones that have gotten burnt out are leaving or planning their exit strategy. Burnout is based on people having just a sense of feeling not valued and overwhelmed and overworked. Now, I can't speak for other hospital workers but myself, but workshops, they're not going to fix a problem. However, eating a better diet tremendously helped me from not burning out. And this is why how you lower your blood sugars is more important to improve blood flow than simply lowering blood sugar. A large observational study followed people for 25 years and found 
cutting all those carbohydrates can actually reduce your life expectancy by up to four years because most people replace carbs with protein and fat from animals. And this is because blood flow is dependent upon multiple factors, including blood pressure, various protein levels like lipoprotein that carry cholesterol and fatty acids, blood cell counts, inflammation, hormones, neurotransmitters, stress and anxiety levels, temperature and blood sugar. Basically, all these things ultimately change your blood flow and your blood pressure. And do you see how improving only blood sugar may not improve your blood flow? And if you think about it, everyone will get a blood sugar spike immediately after eating sugary or starchy foods. The transient fall and rise of glucose, glucose spikes, is normal. Thankfully, a squishy mass of tissue called the pancreas releases insulin, which mops up the sugar and shoves it back into cells. And your blood glucose goes down. Let's not pathologize this normal physiology. Starch breaks down to pure sugar. Wheat flour is a form of starch. So is corn starch. And so is white rice. So if you want better blood sugars, then those items should really be minimized. It seems to me that sugar sugar is misunderstood because people are eating an excess amount of sugary and starchy foods. And they're confusing excess consumption from adequate consumption. And some people believe you don't have to have carbohydrates to survive. Your body doesn't actually need carbohydrates. That's true. You don't have to have it to survive, but you do need it to thrive. However, you do need to consume the right types of carbohydrates. A huge amount of, again, unhealthy carbohydrates, refined starch and sugar in our diet. And if you don't consume carbohydrates, your liver will make carbohydrates like glucose. And there is no one on earth, no matter what diet you are consuming, that can stay alive and not have a measurable amount of glucose. Glucose is the chosen molecule life. Glucose is the energy of life. And I think that should be repeated. Glucose supports life, no matter what diet you eat. And I just mentioned that starch is broken down into sugar. That's because God created plants that beautifully store glucose created by photosynthesis into starch. And that's how plants, they store their energy. And when people and animals eat plants, we are taking that stored energy and using it for our own benefit. And this is why people eat carbohydrates in the form of starch, as well as simple sugars. We also can eat carbohydrates in the form of fiber. But unless you're a herbivore or an insect, you won't have the right gut microbes with enzymes to help you digest that fiber. Do you know how fiber and starch are related? They are both glucose storage molecules. So the fiber that makes the wood holding up your home is literally made out of glucose. And this is why termites can eat your house and thrive. You may be familiar with the term ATP, adenosine triphosphate, the energy molecule to sustain human life. That's how our bodies control the energy created from breaking down glucose. It is packaged into ATP. This is the beauty of the organization of life. Unlike burning your food, which is a haphazard way to release energy. When a phosphate breaks off the ATP, an ADP is made and together they determine your metabolic energy. Now in order for you to make ADP or ATP, you need sugar because did you know that in the middle of an ATP is a sugar molecule called ribose, which is made from glucose. So not only do you need glucose to store ATP energy, but you literally need glucose to make the core structure of ATP. The ratio of ATP and ADP is your energy currency. But did you know that your DNA is also related? DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. Ribo is short for ribose, which is the same five ring sugar molecule in ATP. Again, ribose is made from glucose. Do you see how glucose is essential for life? Your DNA is literally the king of your cell, but even the king needs messengers to help deliver its messages. That's the job of RNA, ribonucleic acid. And again, there is a word ribo, and that's because it too has a ribo sugar. RNA is important for you to make any protein for any reason, from the messengers in your immune system called cytokines, to hormones like insulin, to lipoproteins that shuttle your cholesterol and fatty acids, to your muscle cells. Do you see how glucose is essential for life? But even something as essential as glucose can be harmful full in excess. Just like water, you want enough to drink, cook, clean, and shower, but 
a flood is not exactly good for your home. After you eat starch and sugars, taking a walk, jog, or run can really help prevent that surge of glucose from overwhelming your body. At least two minutes is helpful to dial down that blood sugar level. And in order for you to walk or exercise, you have to have flexible joints. And the only way you're able to flex is because you have covers at the ends of your bones called cartilage. Cartilage allows your bones to slide as opposed to grind when you move. And cartilage is why your nose can move and your ears can bend. They are also made out of cartilage. Can you guess what's similar between a banana peel and your cartilage? If you guess glucose, you are correct. Glucose makes the core chemical structures of fiber, cartilage, and bone. And this is how life is all interconnected. So if you are aggressive with your joints when you're young, you may not have an adequate amount of cartilage when you're old. Because when cartilage gets traumatized, it's very difficult to heal. It takes a long time because there's no active blood flow inside cartilage. And this is why trauma to cartilage, whether it's from playing football or piercing your ear or your nose, can permanently damage damage your cartilage, especially if it gets infected. And this is why I don't recommend piercing the cartilage in your ears or your nose because that can seriously cause deformity if the entire cartilage gets infected. When you eat, you're going to have sugar floating around. Can you guess which organ is supposed to store the sugar? If you guess your muscles, you are correct. So when you eat animal muscle, there's going to be glucose in it in the form of glycogen. All animals store energy in the form of glycogen. And notice how the glycogen molecule is not much different than plant starch. And one of my favorite all-time animals is the panda. And I had the privilege of seeing the giant pandas at the San Diego Zoo recently. A few years back, I went to the world's largest panda conservation center. And the tiniest baby panda were in incubators. I'm so amazed that it can grow to over 250 pounds eating bamboo. I can't even chew through the ends of asparagus. So panda bears have special gut microbes with enzymes called cellulases that can digest their fiber. And can you believe that the only difference between your blood sugar, your glycogen, and fiber are the bonds that link the glucose together? Whether you're a panda bear or a termite, you can thrive on fiber because you have gut microbes with cellulases to digest that cellulose. But people do not. This is why I don't get why cellulose, like what we write on paper is put into breads and cereals and it's supposed to be a health item. Do you see the importance of glucose, an essential molecule that holds the house you're living in? It holds the bones and cartilage that put you together so you can stand up and move. And it's the backbone of your genes, like the DNA, the messengers for your DNA, the RNA, as well as being the structure and function of your energy molecules called ATP and ADP. Knowing this, do you think it's wise to go on a car carbohydrate-free diet when literally your bones, your joints, your metabolism, your genes, they're all dependent upon glucose. But if you are eating carbohydrates that doesn't have glucose, well, that has a totally different effect on your body. But aspartame has been shown to increase body fat, increase weight gain, and obesity when consumed in large amounts, which is equivalent to drinking half a can of Diet Coke every day. Now, if you regularly drink at least half a can of Diet Coke daily, you will have more visceral fat than those who consume little aspartame over several years. Aspartame has been linked to tinnitus, hearing loss, migraines, and movement disorders. But of course, eating an adequate amount is not the same as overeating or getting excess nutrients. And everybody knows you eat too much, you're going to gain weight, especially in your belly. People are horrible at tracking their nutritional intake. There was a study done in people who were obese, who self-reported that they could not lose weight on low calories. They reported that their average intake was 1,200 calories per day. Their actual intake was close to 2,000 calories per day. And when that happens, you'll get high blood sugars. That will reduce your blood flow, causing your tiny blood vessels called capillaries to leak. And unfortunately, choosing the wrong way to lower your blood sugars, it doesn't necessarily stop the progression of clogged arteries or atherosclerosis, as proven by the use of insulin and the treatment of people with diabetes. 
diabetes. The goal is to get to a normal A1C, but how you get there is just as important. And when you eat excess energy, really no matter what form, your body will try to store it. And unfortunately, you have a limited capacity to store glucose as glycogen in your muscles, especially if you are skinny and have very little muscle. So if you want to store more glycogen, then you have to move and exercise and gain more muscle. But sometimes your muscles can get overwhelmed and refuse to store more sugar. We call that insulin resistance. This tells your body to store the sugar in fat cells. And your body basically has an unlimited capacity to store fat. Now, here's the next important point, the link between blood sugar, fat, and blood flow. When your blood sugar goes up, your fat cells will store more fat and your liver will convert your blood sugars into a fat called triglycerides. Elevated triglycerides are known to reduce blood flow. It is also a risk factor for heart disease and strokes. High triglycerides is a bad sign. It's a sign of prediabetes and diabetes. It is also a sign of metabolic syndrome in which there's a triad of high blood pressure, high blood sugar, and obesity. And together, that elevates a person's risk for heart disease. High triglyceride also is a reflection of possibly low thyroid hormone or hypothyroidism. And super high levels, well, that can indicate there's a genetic problem as the body is unable to convert fat into energy. And don't forget, sometimes medications, they can also cause high triglyceride levels. So when you get your lipid panel, you will see several values besides triglycerides which include LDL and HDL. LDL is an important factor that determines your blood flow, but ApoB is even better. And if you want to learn more about LDL and how it's related to ApoB, watch the next video.